Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another Lord's Day that thou hast given us. All our manifold blessings to us, coming to us in and through the Lord Jesus Christ by the power uh, and enlightenment of thy spirit, which is what we are looking at today. We thank thee for this glorious doctrine of regeneration. We thank thee that thou hast saved us and called us with an holy calling, effectual calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We thank thee that thou hast given us thy word to guide us into all truth and thy spirit so that we might be enlightened. We pray that this day the word would go forth in power, not only in this place but throughout all the earth, that thy people would be gathered together. For we know that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, and then and then only shall the end come. We thank thee that thou hast set this one day apart unto thy worship, and that thou hast called us together unto the preaching of thy word, and we pray that it would go forth this day, so that we might be enlightened and that our faith might be increased. So give us this faith. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are, give me that pen over there, will you? Looking at John chapter 3. Or your pen. Just give me your pen a second. John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. Another metaphor. But canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the wind, or that is born of the Spirit. Same word. Nicodemus answered, and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered, and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen. And ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. There is so much in this text, as I hope you're discovering, that I don't know what it is. Is it that we're so slow getting to it? One thing we're not going to be dealing with today is these two words that occur more than once in the text. Verily, verily. By the grace of God, we shall be dealing with that. Uh, but again, it's so full of important doctrine. Last week we dealt with well, we collated, and that's a good word. We, we want to, as we say from time to time, bring back good words. C-O-L-L-A-T-E. We collated Luke 19, verse 5, with John 3, 7. In Luke 19, our Lord says to Zacchaeus, I must abide at thy house. In John 3, 7, it tells us, Ye must be born. I must, ye must. Same word. Both texts use exactly the same word. Also, we said that in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, keeping in mind, I must abide at thy house. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. I must abide at thy house which is, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 1, this body in which we reside. I must, Christ said. We could have used, though we didn't, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own. Your body, I must abide at thy house. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So, Luke 19, 5, I must abide thy house. John 3, 7, you must be born again. Ephesians 3, 17 says this. Well, let's look at it. I think it's probably necessary that we pay even closer attention today because there are so many verses we're going to be looking at. Hopefully we can see the relationship between these verses and how important it is this topic, and that we get these things sorted out in our minds. 2 Corinthians 3.17 That Christ, excuse me, not 2 Corinthians, Ephesians. Ephesians 3.17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. I must abide at thy house. The earthly house of this tabernacle. This house. Know ye not that, the, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That Christ may dwell in this temple. May dwell in your hearts. I must abide at thy house. But there's, in another sense, from another standpoint, there's really no need to collate these two texts because in our text itself, at the end of chapter 2, we saw, did we not, John 2, verse 19, Christ says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So we see how all these things are so closely related. And we saw last week in our message, though we preached a few messages ago, on the absolute necessity. We, at the time, I, didn't, I hadn't come to the realization completely of what it was I was actually saying and the importance of it. One reason that Christ says in John 3, 7, you must be born again. 
is, last week we said, Nicodemus clearly, I believe, in the text, not only this particular text, but when we get to chapter 7, Nicodemus was a sheep of God. And to be a sheep of God, Christ had to dwell in his heart by faith. Ephesians 3 tells us that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Ephesians 3.17 along with John 14.6. How about the relationship between those two verses? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Which is to say, no man cometh unto the Father unless I dwell in your heart. And I dwell in your hearts by faith. Except a man be born again. He cannot notice. See how closely related these texts all are. And the importance of it. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And seeing the kingdom of God is the very essence of faith. And Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. What's our working definition of a Christian? Hebrews 11. What does Hebrews 11.13 tell us? These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To see the kingdom of God is to see these promises. The promise of Christ, not only as prophet, not only as priest, but as king. The kingdom of God. Christ comes to rule. And Christ, uh, Acts 13, 48 tells us this same idea that Christ is getting across to Nicodemus. Acts 13, 48. As many, I hope I think a lot of us have already memorized this key verse. As many as were ordained to eternal life believe you must partake Christ is saying to Nicodemus you must be born again you must partake of eternal life as many as were ordained to eternal life see the importance of this word you must partake of eternal life he says to Nicodemus but you don't possess it and you can't achieve it So I hope we're seeing the beauty of this text. So Christ is saying to Nicodemus, as he says to us, something must happen to you. You don't possess this life, which you must have in an absolute sense. And you can do nothing yourself to achieve it. Something must happen to you. I admit that last week's sermon was a bit difficult to get a hold of. Um, for a number of reasons. We said, I was, I've been reading Stephen Charnock along with listening to many, many, many different sermons on this text. And Charnock says that in, in accordance with the doctrine of regeneration, regeneration, a person must be regenerated relative to gospel service. He also says a person must be regenerated relative to union with Christ. In other words, there is no gospel service without regeneration. There is no union with Christ apart from regeneration. But Christ in John 3, 7, we believe, is not speaking in a relative sense, even though, once again, there is no Christian service apart from regeneration. There is no union with Christ apart from regeneration. But we believe that Christ is speaking not in a relative sense, but in an absolute sense. Because, once again, and we have to pay close attention to what we're saying here, Nicodemus was a sheep of God, first of all. Secondly, faith in Christ unites us 
to the Father. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. So first of all, he was a sheep of God. Secondly, faith in Christ unites us to the Father. And though we said faith and regeneration can be distinguished, they cannot be separated. And there's no text which is clearer on this point than this very text. Except a man be born again. Regeneration. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Faith and regeneration can be distinguished, cannot be separated. We said that logically speaking, regeneration must precede faith because after all, what can a man do? How can a man exercise faith who has no life? But temporally speaking, as far as time is concerned, the two things occur simultaneously. This chapter and this section also tells us the importance of this concept of equal ultimacy. Once again, these terms sound complicated, but they're not complicated. So don't believe they're complicated. Equal ultimacy simply means this. That everything that happens in the universe, ultimately speaking, happens according to the will of God. The will of God is the determining factor. Why do you live where you live? Right? Why are you listening to this sermon right now? Why are you breathing right now? Ultimately speaking, the will of God. That's what equal ultimate C says. And this is related to if everything that happens happens ultimately according to the will of God. This must include, with no exceptions, it must include why some people end up in heaven, why other people end up in hell. In an ultimate sense. In fact, the very first verse of the Bible teaches equal ultimacy. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Did, did God create the heavens and the earth in response to a suggestion on another person's part? Couldn't be. Nobody else existed. So why? And we don't have to go far to find the answer. Why did God create the heavens and the earth? Revelation 4.11. This verse is quoted way too infrequently, even by ourselves, I must admit. Revelation 4, 11, because of this all-important doctrine of regeneration. Revelation 4, 11. Thou art worthy. O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and work. Why did God create the heavens and the earth? According to Revelation 4.11. For thy pleasure they are and were created. And this word pleasure is a very interesting word. It occurs 65 times in the New Testament. 63 out of the 65 times, it is translated by the word will, by thy will, for thy pleasure. And it is the most common word for will in the Bible. So, Revelation 4.11 tells us that all things were created by the will of God. Which is saying, because he wanted to. And let's not pass over this too quickly because of the importance of it. King James Version says, For thy pleasure they were and were created. And this is a good translation. I'm not criticizing the translation. Though 63 out of the 65 times this word occurs, it's translated will. It simply means this. All things were created because it pleased God to do so. Because he wanted to. And so it should come as no surprise that we see what we see in James 1, 18. 
Because we have been making this point again and again and again because it's so important. What point? The point that the physical creation is, how can it be doubted? It can't be doubted. Is a type of the spiritual creation. So should it come as, a, as any surprise? No, it doesn't come as a surprise. Because perhaps the most frequently versed that we quote is found in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. You see this? Physical creation, type. Spiritual creation, antitype. For God who, crea who commanded the light in the first creation to shine out of darkness, let there be light, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you see why we frequently quote this verse? Because of its all importance. And especially insofar as our topic today is concerned. Physical creation in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Spiritual creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. First creation, type. Physical creation. Second creation, antitype. We said type is the symbol. Antitype is that to which the symbol refers. That which is represented by the type. And so it should come as no surprise that we can compare Revelation 4.11 with James 1.18, which says this. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his fruit. You see that? Revelation 4.11. By his pleasure or by his will, he created all things. James 1.18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Physical creation. Why did God create? In the beginning, God created the heavens. Why? Because he wanted to. Of his will. By his will. Spiritual creation. Of his own will begat he us. And so, what is the ultimate reason? If you are indeed a regenerate man, what is the ultimate reason? The ultimate reason is because God wanted to. The importance of the will of God. On this subject. Genesis 1-3. And God said. Let there be light. Psalm 33-9. Let's look at that. We're still thinking of James. See I told you we're looking at quite a few verses. So we have to pay closer attention than we usually do. Psalm 33-9. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. God said, let there be light. He spake, and it was done. James 1.18 says, of his own will, begat he us with the word of truth. So, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. All things, verse 3 says, were created by him. And without him was not anything made that was made by his word. And as important, notice we're spending time on this, as important as this is, this point, that everything was created by the word of God. We are regenerated by the word. There is something that is even more important than the Word of God. And what is that? The reason is that God's Word, though it is the agent in creation, though it is the agent in regeneration, it is not the source of regeneration. The source of regeneration, we're told, 
in James 1.18, clearly, of his own will. Begat he has. By the word. The word is the agent. God's will is the source. Source in the first creation. Source in the second creation. Back to equal ultimacy. Why is equal ultimacy true? And why do our greatest enemies, the Calvinists, deny equal ultimacy? We said, since the first creation is, has its source in the will of God. Second creation, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The source is God's will. And don't forget, question 20 of the Shorter Catechism. Did God leave all mankind to perish? Instead of saying, God having out of his mere good pleasure. You think that's a coincidence that they use that word? Out of his mere good pleasure? No. They knew, John, they, they knew Revelation 4.11. By his pleasure. Owing to the will of God. The source of the first creation. The source of the second creation. So we must ask the question regarding equal ultimacy. Since ultimately speaking, everything is owing to, has its source in the will of God. It must be the case that the reason why some people end up in heaven and other people end up in hell is owing to the same source, God's will. And we're going to see, Lord willing, in a few minutes just why our opponents oppose this concept. At the same time, since John 3.18 is in our same text, in our same context, what does it tell us? He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Does the scripture teach, does, does John 3.18 teach that some people go to hell because of unbelief? The answer is resounding yes. But we must add, that's not the ultimate reason. Because the ultimate reason, as we have seen, for the physical creation, spiritual creation, the will of God. Of his own will, he got us. By thy pleasure, they are and were created. And what is, what could we, we could even say this way. What is the ultimate equal ultimacy verse? <laughs> you could probably come up with it in no time at all. Romans 9.18. The whole scripture teaches equal ultimacy. But the ultimate, I say, equal ultimacy verse is Romans 9.18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will. Leave out the italicized word. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will, and whom he will, he hardeneth. The will of God determines ultimately who ends up in hell, who makes it to heaven. Christ in John 3, 3, John 3, 5, and John 3, 7. He's saying to Nicodemus, our point the whole of last week's message. And it's so important that we want to, as they say, iterate and reiterate it. Christ says to Nicodemus, you must be born again because it is God's will that you be born again. This determines everything. That's why it's such an egregious offense. A few weeks back, I mentioned that I was listening to a sermon by a famous, uh, semi-famous reformed pastor who was trying to make the point that, in, that Christ in telling Nicodemus ye must be born again, he wasn't commanding him to go out and get born again. He wasn't commanding him to do something. That was his point. And as an illustration, he used this fact that 
perhaps the most famous evangelist of the 20th century, wrote a book to illustrate that some people really believe that Christ was commanding Nicodemus to do something in order to be born again. He wrote a book called How to Be Born Again. And in the midst of his mentioning this as an illustration that you can't do anything to bring about your salvation. He said, this evangelist is dead now and he's in heaven. He doesn't understand the gospel. He doesn't understand this mega important concept of the will of God. See, because he was saying this. This person who wrote this book, the pastor to which this the evangelist to which this pastor referred, to say that it is not the will of God that is the ultimate determining factor in your salvation. It's something that you, it's your will. The opposite of the gospel. Because equal, why are we mentioning equal ultimacy? Because equal ultimacy is everything. It's not something. Another more famous reformed pastor on this same text Preaching a sermon makes the point. See, both of them make the point that you can't do anything to bring about your salvation. The first pastor says, but I guess you can because this guy who says that man does something to bring about his salvation is in heaven. This other more famous reformed pastor says you can't do anything. She said they start with the truth and then they say but. Something else. He says you can't do anything to bring about your salvation. And then five minutes later, he's saying, but if you want to be regenerated, you can't do anything to be regenerated, to be born again. But if you want to be born again, oh, wait a second. If you want to be born again, you already are. Because no man seeketh after God. But he said, if you want to be born again, you college students that are cheating on your exam, you need to stop cheating on your exams. Which is to say what? You can do something. One of the reasons why this doctrine is so important is because it is basically across the board denied. Christ says to the infidels of his day, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Because I, not in spite of the fact. Last week we tried to uh, relate this doctrine to the text we preached on for about three years, Isaiah 52, 7. Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. You see that? You must be born again because God reigns. God determines everything. Contrast this idea with the Southern Baptist hymn that I sang from time to time when I was a kid. And nobody, I repeat, nobody objected to the message in this hymn. And nobody in my church objected to the message of this hymn for the same reason that I didn't object to it. Because I believed it. And here's what it says. If you are tired, if you are tired of the load of your sin, let Jesus come into your heart. If you desire a new life to begin, let Jesus come. If you desire a new life to begin, nobody seeks after God. Nobody objected to the hymn. Why? Because they all believed the message of it, which is the exact opposite of the message in John 3. We may seem to be jumping from place to place for the past few weeks. And the reason is because verse 3, verse 5, and verse 7 are so closely related. Let's read them again. Verse 3, first, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. Verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And once again, this, these three verses are so um, chock full of important doctrine. This word again is another interesting word. 
because it has two meanings. You've probably heard this before. It can be translated, except a man, as in our text, except a man be born again. King James translation, it can also mean except a man be born from above. So what's the correct translation? The answer is yes. Is it you must be born again or is it you must be born from above? The answer, yes. Not either or, but both and. And if you read the Gospel of John, you discover after a while that John loves to employ what's called sometimes double entendre. Double meaning. Frequently. For example, look at John 14, 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. This can also be translated, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. See? Indicative and imperative. Both are acceptable translations. So which does he mean? Which does Christ mean? Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe. See, you, you can't be troubled because you believe in God. Or he could have meant, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. So, which does he mean? Not either or, but both and. John 1, 5. The same gospel. Just to point out, we're pointing out how frequently the Apostle John uses this concept, this literary device of double meaning to communicate to us. John 1, 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Comprehended it not. Catalambano, comprehended. It can either mean the darkness comprehended it not, or it can mean the darkness could not overcome it. So which one does he mean? Not either or, but both in. John 6, 28 and 29. These are just a few examples. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? In other words, what, might, what shall we do that we might do that which God requires of us? And Christ's answer is, this is not what God requires of us. This is the source. And that is the work of God. Faith has its source in God's work. It's not your work, but it's God's work. Back to John 3, 3, except a man be born again. Why is it translated born again or rebirth? The reason is that it can mean again. And another reason is translated this way, other than except a man be born from above, even though both translations are acceptable is Nicodemus's reaction to the statement. Can I enter in the second time, see, born again? The second time in my mother's womb and be born? So, but this other translation, except the man be born from above, the importance of it, which is exactly what Christ is getting across to Nicodemus. Once again, James 1.18, of his own will, Except a man be born of the will of God. That's what being born from above means. Not from your will, but of his will. And let's just interject John 3.16 here. One reason why people get this wrong from a human standpoint, we know the ultimate reason. One reason that 
why they get John 3.16 wrong from a human standpoint is they don't consider the context. They take it as an independent statement. But the context is the context we're dealing with right here. And that is John 3, verses 3 through 7. Except a man be born again, born from above, born from without himself. I love this statement. A text without a context is a pretext. What does that mean? Most people, I didn't, I didn't understand it the first time I heard it, the first five times I heard it. A text without a context is a pretext. What is a pretext? A pretext is an excuse for the most part. John 3.16 is used as an excuse to believe in the free will of man. It's used as an excuse to believe that God loves every single individual. Because if it were taken in his context... It would be impossible to be rendered in such a way. But free will is not only not contained in John 3.16, but the context absolutely demands that it not mean such a thing. Because of Christ's words and Nicodemus' response. See, his response. What do you mean? Can I enter into the second, second time in the month? He knows he couldn't do that. Christ is driving him to total despair of being able to do anything. His response shows it. He knows he couldn't enter the second time into his mother's womb. So what could Christ possibly be meaning? So Christ is not only not exhorting Nicodemus to do something. Because... There is, because if he were so doing, he would be communicating that there's hope in doing. Except a man be born again. You need to do something because there's hope in doing. It's just the opposite. And Christ is our example in evangelism. Christ brings Nicodemus through his words. Except a man. Marvel not that I say to thee, you must be born again. Born from above. Born according to the will of God. He's bringing him to helplessness and hopelessness. And this is encouraging to me because for the past three years or so, that's exactly what we've been saying again. And how many times have we said it? Hope comes through total despair. Through total despair of you being able to do anything. Love for the law drives us to Christ's propitiation. And do you recall the example of Calvin, his illustration or his exposition of Jacob's wrestling with the angel, which we believe to be a, what is called a theophany. What is a theophany? A theophany is an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And so Calvin takes Jacob's wrestling with the angel to be a perfect example of the gospel. He says that Jacob, back to John 1, 5, where it says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. So we see Jacob's wrestling with the angel. He could not overcome it. How could he possibly, if this is indeed a theophany, that he was indeed wrestling with God in the flesh? Both the gospel and Jacob's wrestling with the angel dr drove him to total despair. But the good news is that your defeat is your victory. Genesis 32, 28. Jacob's name was changed afterwards. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. And what does that mean? For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Sometimes we read right over these things so, too quickly. How is it possible for him to be wrestling with God himself and prevail? The answer 
Calvin suggests is that Christ in wrestling with Jacob, God in the flesh wrestling with Jacob, was wrestling with his right hand, with his left hand. His left hand wrestling with him. Opposing him with his law. And upholding him with the right hand. What right hand? Look at Isaiah 41.10. God wrestling with Jacob with the left hand of his law. Opposing him with his law. Isaiah 41.10. Upholding him with his right hand. Attacking him with his left hand. Upholding him with his right hand. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Beautiful concept. Jacob would have been destroyed by the law were it not for one thing, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's righteousness, because we have none of the righteousness that God demands of us, and he shows us that through his law. Which leads us to Christ. We are brought to, to total despair, though not in an absolute sense, because to be brought to total despair in an absolute sense would be to be annihilated. But God, through the left hand of his law in evangelism, drives us to the righteousness of Christ. And in evangelism, we can use any one of the, the Ten Commandments, but we must use it in a certain way. We must use it to drive a person to total despair of his having any righteousness whatsoever. For example, we could use the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. 1 John 3.15 says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer to drive us to see that our innate hatred for our fellow man shows that we are murderers from birth. So God, as with Dick Nicodemus, wrestles with his left hand, with the hand of his law, causing him to despair of anything in himself. Said in another way, your only qualification is your disqualification. Today's gospel is this. All you have to do is fill in the blank. The biblical gospel is all that you have to do is the only thing. It's the one thing that you're totally unable to do. Sinners are so depraved that they can't even understand a waterfall in the natural realm. They can't understand a sunset. They don't understand the beautiful cry of a baby, his first cry and coming out of the womb. Because the sinner sees these things as God saying, I love you. Whereas in reality, God is saying, love me. And get this. The sinner not only does not love God. And it's not even this. It's not that the sinner hates God despite all the beauties of creation. But he's hates God because of his creation. It must be so. Because once again, Christ says to the infidels of his day, because I tell you the truth, not despite the fact that I tell you. Now, maybe if I gave a few more illustrations, if I performed a few more miracles, explain myself more clearly, you might come around. No, because I tell you the truth, you believe not. And Romans 1.20 says, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. God is speaking to us in creation. And because he's speaking to us in creation, we believe him not. If you've ever dealt with poor people, 
which I can say with certainty, if you've never left the United States, you've never dealt with poor people. You've never seen poor people. I've seen people living in cardboard boxes. I knew a couple, the wife of which was a college grad. This was 25 years ago, which is about 25 months ago. The wife of which was a college graduate who made 25 cents an hour. College graduate. Only 25 years ago. And so when I gave this couple, we gave this couple an opportunity to make multiples and multiples more money than they made before. They were overjoyed, were they not? No! Because, as in the case of God's creation, it's never enough. They don't hate God despite his, the beauty of his creation. They hate God because of it. So Christ in John 3, 3, except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Your salvation must be from above and not from yourself. Because you do not and you will not desire this salvation. Verse 6 of our chapter says this conclusively where the Lord says to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is the same idea that we find in Romans 8. So then, or verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's exactly what it means. And that which is born, John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh, that which is born at enmity against God, is flesh. So Christ is saying to Nicodemus, not only that you are flesh, but they, that you are born of the flesh. This is very appropriate to us because we're dealing in our Bible study with Galatians 3.17, are we not? Excuse me, 5.17. What does it say? For the flesh, same idea, lusteth against the spirit at enmity against the spirit. That was born of the flesh. You were born of the flesh. And so, last week's principle, we said the principle of sanctification is be what you are. And let us remind ourselves that the, what's the principle of justice? Remember? Principle of sanctification, be what you are. Christ is exercising the principle of justification here. Be Nicodemus. Be what you are not. That was just born of the flesh. You're born of the flesh. You must be born again. Because you must be born from above. You must be born of the will of God. God does all things. All things that transpire, transpire ultimately have their source in the will of God. Lastly, there's something else which is so important in this verse, John 3, 3, that we would be remiss if we didn't spend time on it. And I think we're going to end up spending a lot of time on it because it's just this important. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Two weeks ago, we explained the relationship of regeneration to the other four points, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, regeneration is the eye, irresistible grace, and then perseverance of the saints. The relationship of regeneration to the other four points. But today we want to end 
by pointing out that not only is John 3, 3 important because of the doctrine of regeneration, but it is important because it is one of the clearest verses in all of Scripture to explain the relationship. See? To think is to see relationships. The relationship of regeneration to faith. One of the clearest verses in all of Scripture. And get this. Both faith and regeneration belong to the fourth point. So we're not relating regeneration to the first point, to the second point, or the, to the third point, or to the fifth point, but to itself. Effectual calling, same idea. Irresistible grace, regeneration. Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit. Whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ and renewing our effectual calling is the work of God's will. Whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ and renewing our wills. He does persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us. In the, that's the, exactly, ex, the exact same thing we're be, being taught in John 3.3. 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the, and to see the kingdom of God is to exercise faith. Embrace Jesus Christ is to exercise faith. The relationship of regeneration to faith is so important that to get this right equals eternal acceptance with God. Everybody who gets it right. The relationship between regeneration and faith. Eternal acceptance with God. To get it wrong is eternal damnation in hell. And am I pontificating? What does pontificating mean? That means to say something is true because I said so. Is it true to say that everyone who gets the relationship between regeneration and faith right has eternal acceptance with God and everybody who gets it wrong 100% spends eternity in hell? Well, Scripture is our soul ground of truth. Faith, number one. The importance of the relationship between regeneration and except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Once again, let's go back to our definition of a Christian. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. That's faith. Except a man be born again, he cannot exercise faith. First of all, faith is a work of man. First Corinthians, First Thessalonians 1 3, we have to point this out. First Thessalonians 1 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of Faith and labor of First of all, faith is a work of man. Secondly, Ephesians 2, 89. We've all memorized that, right? For by grace are ye saved through faith and referring to faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that, meaning faith, is the gift of God. So first of all, faith is the work of man. Secondly, it's the gift of God. Seems like a contradiction. It isn't. Because these two concepts fit like a glove in John 3.3. 3. Except a man be born again. He cannot exercise faith. Two parts. Number one, born again. Number two, see the kingdom of God. To be born again is regeneration. To see the kingdom of God is faith. We just proved it. He's all died in faith, not in having received. See the promises, but having seen, to see the promises is to exercise. To see the kingdom of God is to exercise faith. Fourthly, there are only two religious positions. Get this straight. Grace and works. So the first point, faith is a work of man. Secondly, faith is a gift of God. Thirdly, these two concepts go together. 
Yes, and they go together in John 3, 3. Except it may be born again. You kind of see the kingdom of God. Born again regeneration. See the kingdom of God faith. Fourth point. There are only two religious positions, grace and works. First of all, to believe in grace is salvation. Because we are born of the flesh. We're not born believing in grace. We're born believing in works. Secondly, to believe in works is to deny salvation. To believe in grace is salvation. To believe in works is to deny. Only two religious positions. Grace and works. Fifthly, to believe in works is to believe that God, what does it mean when we say justification by works? What do we, we have to define our terms. We mean this. To believe in works is to believe that God accepts you on the basis of anything that you do. Praying three hours a day. Handing out tracts two hours a day. Giving goods to feed the poor. Or believing in Christ. To believe in works is to believe that God accepts you on the basis of anything you do. We just established that faith is a work. 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. To believe that God accepts you on the basis of faith, since faith is a work. To believe that God accepts you on the basis of faith is to believe that God accepts you on the basis of works. Sixthly, to believe that faith precedes regeneration is to deny grace and to believe in works. Because what you're saying is you can exercise faith before you're born again and be accepted by God on that basis. John Wesley said this. Why do I bring up John Wesley? I don't like to bring up people's names. But sometimes the message necessitates it. And you'll see in a second why I bring up his name. John Wesley. This guy was so influential. It's phenomenal. He made this statement. God accepts our faith instead of perfect righteousness. What does that mean? When I read that statement, I meditated on it, and I discovered not long thereafter, this is exactly everything I was taught in the Southern Baptist Church about salvation. What's he saying? God accepts our faith instead of perfect righteousness? He's saying this. God plays head games. God knows your faith isn't perfect righteousness. He pretends like it is and accepts you on that basis. That's exactly what I was taught. Nobody in the Southern Baptist Church was smart enough to say it that way, but that's exactly what they meant. God accepts your faith. See, you believe and then God regenerates you instead of perfect righteousness. I contend that this is what not only what I believe, but what all Southern Baptists believe. Owing to the hymn that I just quoted a few minutes ago, if you're tired of the load of your sin, let Jesus come into your heart. If you desire a new life to begin, let Jesus come in. Believe in Jesus and you will be regenerated. And then lastly, the scriptural... A severation as to what this means. What does it mean to believe that God accepts you on the basis of faith? That God accepts your faith instead of perfect righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 30. There is no question as to what God says this means about a person. Who says this? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble, mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that in order that no flesh should 
glory in his presence. The purpose of God's revelation of salvation is so that no man will have any reason whatsoever to glory. But saying that faith precedes regeneration is a hole as big as a mantra to glory in the presence of God. So what does this mean? It means everyone who believes that faith, everyone who gets John 3, 3 wrong, ends up in hell. That no flesh should glory. So, it's a good test, isn't it? If anything in your concept of salvation gives any ground whatsoever for boasting to say this, and this is what we believed when I was going, and everybody, no exception. God loves everybody. Christ died for everybody. It's up to you to make your decision. And when you make your decision, you look at other people who haven't made their decision thusly. He was just as capable of doing what I did as I was. I did it and he didn't do it. That's 100% grounds for boasting. What verse did I quote? In our opening prayer, we'll end with this. 2 Timothy 1.9. Who has saved us? This is antithesis. Men and women. Brethren. This is antithesis. 2 Timothy 1.9. Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling. Not according to our works. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this wondrous passage, which is so important that to get it wrong is to end up in eternal hell torments. We pray that that would cause us to get it right. We cannot get it right. We cannot get it right. Unless, as Christ said to Nicodemus, we must be born again. Thou hast determined from the foundation of the world to work this faith in us to drive us to total despair of having any righteousness to recommend ourselves to thee. Drive us to despair of doing anything which would cause us in any way to be acceptable in thy sight. It is only the perfect righteousness of Christ which comes to us through the faith which the Holy Spirit works in us in this, our regeneration. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.